Today is the first day of this seven day session here in July, 2021 in Northern New Mexico at Mountain Gate in the monsoon. It's been raining gloriously. Rain is something that is uh, celebrated in New Mexico. Uh, although I think some of you in the other parts of the country are having a, a bit more than you'd like to have. Um, but we're, we've been in a drought for literally decades here, a serious drought. And it appears that this may be uh, this year, this monsoon being as enthusiastic as it is, could balance out that drought. That's the news so far. We'll see if it, if it uh, happens. It's been raining much more <clears throat> in my experience, for having lived in New Mexico since 1981 with a few forays elsewhere. <clears throat> and uh, often uh, we joke about the rainy season being our five drop thunderstorm late in the afternoon. Um, and that's, that's our rainstorm for today. <clears throat> but this time, this year, we've had considerably more rain and more extended downpours, which is um, terrific for us. Uh, there have been challenges with flash floods. That's a normal situation in New Mexico. But we're so high up in the mountains, uh, we don't have any real option for a flash flood where we are. But it's wonderful to have the moisture. <clears throat> This being the, <clears throat> the first day of Sashin, I'd like to share something of the life and teachings of Joko Beck. Joko Beck was uh, an American Zen master. And I, I think saying she was a master is, is appropriate. Um, she was the first American teacher to step out of the mold of Japanese Zen. In other words, there's a certain style, at least in my experience, of teaching that was, that is the way Zen practice is taught in Japan. <clears throat> and it is uh, essentially so because the culture is very different from our Western culture. But Joko opened her eyes and opened the eyes of some of the rest of us through her observations, one of her books, Everyday Zen, um, was an unusual book for its time. <clears throat> and, and she had a, a previous one to that as well. And now she's come out of the, out of the uh, realm of the, I don't know what you'd call it. She died a number of years ago. But this new book called Ordinary Wonder is a book of her teachings that was put together by one of her daughters who um, listened to her tapes of Joko's Teishos and compiled this very, very interesting book, Ordinary Wonder. This is, this is what Joko expressed as, as, as Zen practice. It's not just Zen practice, it's also what we can open to. Wonder is not normally considered ordinary, but to have a Kensho experience is to both at the same time experience amazement and wonder and yet, what we open to in a Kensho is, well, of course it's like this, quite ordinary, quite ordinary. As we do our practice, <clears throat> we bump into ourselves, which is actually the practice working. 
because as I've said so many times, we cannot become free of our mechanisms for creating suffering without knowing what they are, without experiencing them. And Joko has, has spoken to this <coughs> in, the, in the foreword to this book, or no, it's the introduction. Um, the introduction was actually written by, by um, uh, a Dharma friend of mine, uh, Chosen Bayes, who's a pediatrician. And she speaks from her own experience and training when she says, um, before birth, the world satisfies all that is needed in the womb. After birth, however, the infant's needs can never be totally met by others. Unable to conceive that there could be an issue with the parents on whom the infant is totally dependent, a seed is planted. The problem must be with the young baby. This is a classic assumption that children make when things are not so great in their lives, particularly with regard to uh, people uh, ignoring them or abusing them or otherwise creating uh, exceptional discomfort for them. The child has no other, no other way to understand it, that if they were better, if they were good enough, then um, that wouldn't be happening to them. But of course, we know as adults that these kinds of things happen because the adults in babies' lives are, are less than able, for whatever reasons, to fulfill their responsibilities as, as parents or caregivers. But the baby doesn't know that. And even if the baby knew it, I'm not sure it would make a difference. Chosen continues. The baby feels there must be something wrong with itself. And this is the foundation of the core belief. The infant then develops a strategy to get what it wants. The baby will cry, please, or be defiant, among other options, in its efforts to get its needs satisfied. There are many strategies, but all are aimed toward the same goal, feeling safe and loved. Safe and loved both essential for a healthy growing up. In the world, since the infant feels its very survival is at stake, it earnestly adopts these strategies, finding a, key, finding a few key ones that seem to work or becoming eternally discouraged when nothing does seem to work. For most of us, and here's the rub, these strategies continue and reinforce themselves throughout our lives. They congeal around a few key themes into what Joko called the basic strategy, even though for the most part, as we grow up, they no longer work. The core belief is always a negative belief we have about ourselves, an opinion so painful that we'll do almost anything to avoid feeling our abject sense of unlivability and worthlessness. The basic strategies of our ardent, our, are our ardent but diluted responses, fixed reaction in a fluid world. There's a lot of research <clears throat> these days into the results of what are known as adverse childhood experiences among people and, and how when a child is, is loved and cared for securely and, and consistently enough, they develop what is known as secure attachment. Now, this is not the attachment that we um, are uh, trying to let go of in our Zen practice. This, is a, this means a, a connection with another human being and with the world at, at, in general. 
when a parent is sometimes there and sometimes not, sometimes attentive and sometimes not, when the child's needs are sometimes met and sometimes not, <clears throat> then the child uh, develops uh, something more insecure. And uh, it's often labeled insecure attachment. So the child grows up not knowing whether they can trust other people, whether they can trust situations um, and so on. And there are other versions of uh, how, how children grow in terms of their self-image, depending on how they are treated on a relatively regular basis by their caregivers. None of that is really the fault of the child. Although children, as they grow, some of their coping strategies are to be uh, negative and belligerent in order to get attention that they didn't get when they were being nice. We all have some level of these strategies. We all have some level of conditioning. And those of us who come to Zen practice usually have some that's not so nice because people who feel fine don't ordinarily come to Zen practice. Tony Packer once said to me, I only know one person who didn't come to Zen practice out of pain and suffering, but it only took him six months to uncover it. And that's what we are doing in our Zen practice unwittingly. It's not something we bargained for ordinarily. We come to Zen practice uh, lured by the a sense, the assumptions, the sense that there's something special we can get, something liberating we can get. It's going to be really terrific. Not only that, but we will be Zen people. The thing is, and I don't know how, if there are still people that feel that way, um, that was how it was back in the old days. Come, come to Zen practice and get Satori. Oh my God, get Satori and be free. Well, <clears throat> in order to open to Satori, it's not about getting Satori, it's about opening to recognition of the truth, which it comes when it is deep enough with such amazement that it, it, it can feel glorious. But we also recognize that, yes, in one side, it's, it's glorious, but in another side, it's, us, of course, it's like this. So we start Zen practice with um, some ideas about things. And it takes us a little while to get our sea leg, so to speak, to get um, accustomed to sitting on the cushion or in a chair, whichever you do, uh, to sitting, trying to focus your, your mind on whatever your assigned practice is. And here, uh, the optimal practice is known as uh, Susopkan or the extended out breath because it's a tremendously powerful grounding practice. And it is the standard Rinzai practice uh, other than koans. <clears throat> and of course, you can do Sosokan and koans simultaneously. Um, but we won't get into that. That's advanced practice. So we start out practicing and we begin to kind of get a handle on the physical aspects of it. Of course, there are painful backs, there are painful knees, um, there's boredom, there's frustration, there's even, there can be anger. I remember one time at Rochester Zen Center in Sashin, um, where the Kyosaku, the encouragement stick was being used uh, mightily uh, at one point, the monitor uh, started to, to, to strike the, the traditional double strike uh, on 
one of the participants' shoulders, and I could see him out of the corner of my eye. He was just down the, the row from me. And he wheeled around and grabbed the stick and wrestled the monitor to the floor. Um, he was furious. Now, we have all kinds of interesting uh, experiences in Zen. And, and um, I remember some other times when, when there were people who were uh, well, I was walking around in Kinhin during a, during a session once, <clears throat> and the person ahead of me, immediately ahead of me, would take three steps and jump up in the air and do a little dance in the air, come down, do three more steps, and then repeat. And he did this around the entire zendo. I finally had to get out of the line because it was just too hysterical. It was just too funny, and I was afraid I was going to really be distracted from my practice. <clears throat> On the other hand, um, I admit I was a relative newbie back then. Many years further, Roshi Kaplow gave session at Bodhi Manda in Hamas Springs, New Mexico. And we never knew what to expect there, which was actually quite good for Zen practice. <clears throat> and um, at Bodhi, uh, if any of you have ever been there, uh, they have hot springs, as are there are a fair number of hot springs in northern New Mexico. It's a um, former volcanic area, maybe not so formal. And, and so um, part of their income comes from uh, rental out of uh, space so that people can enjoy the hot springs. And uh, during our sessions there, the Bodhi staff always stayed at, at uh, Sashin in their own quarters. And on the seventh day of one of those Sashins, uh, there was a, a crew of men working during the work period, uh, pulling grass and weeds uh, from around the hot springs when the Bodhi women decided it was time for their soak. And they came down and stripped naked and got in the pool. Um, one of the members of the weeding team actually was so focused. I, I don't think he even noticed, but uh, I can tell you this, he did have a Kensho later that day. And I'm sure it wasn't because of seeing naked women. I'm sure it was because he was so absorbed in his practice that uh, it could have been pink elephants dancing in front of him and he would not have noticed. And that is something that we need to consider. Focus is vital in our practice. What we're doing is a vast exploration of our mind. And this is one of the most difficult things to get to this focus if we have had adverse childhood experiences. And as I said earlier, most of the people who come to Zen practice have had some level of such a thing. And, and so there's a kind of a walled off area within ourselves that we don't want to open to. And uh, this is also addressed in this uh, introduction. The crux of practice with the core belief is to continue on from mere psychological understanding and do the work none of us want to do. We must rest and sit in the experiential pain that is the very difficult heart of our practice. This is resting in the present moment. This is Zen practice. The paradox is that when one truly rests in this pain, the experience disappears and there's no pain. There's no one to experience the pain. And this is not something we can try to do. The paradox of practice is that as we use tremendous effort to stay with the pain, 
the best we can, it slowly erodes. And moments can arise of no effort, of just pain, just joy. And the pain does not have the bite that pain normally does. Jacques Lucerin, whom you've heard me speak of many times, was a blind Frenchman who was um, rounded up by the Gestapo during the Second World War. He was instrumental with his high school friends in establishing a, a massive um, the resistance movement in France. And it was highly successful. But there was a, a, a man that, that was allowed into the group who betrayed the small group of people that they were clever enough to uh, limit identification of. It was only Jacques who was the prime interviewer and the person who yayed or nayed any new person coming into the group. Uh, he was the only person that knew all of the members because he was the one that passed or failed them. And uh, otherwise, any, any person within the group only knew about maybe 20 other people in the group. That was all, all the identification they, they had. Uh, it was a safety mechanism, obviously. And so uh, Jacques and, and uh, a small group of people were arrested and eventually sent to Buchenwald. And of those 22, I think it was, um, I think there were only three that survived. But one of them was Jacques. And Jacques ordinarily being blind would have been put to death immediately on entry into the camp, which by the way, was in January in the middle of a blizzard that he said lasted for six more weeks. But another inmate who was doing intake of the new batch of prisoners uh, whispered to him that he needed to identify himself as a translator. So he did. It was written down in the intake that he was a translator of, uh, what was it, Polish uh, and two other languages, none of which was German, by the way, although he could speak German. And, and so he was spared, but he was also housed in what was known as the invalid's block, which was in a building that would have been crowded with 400 men, had a thousand men. And these were men that the Nazis deemed unfit for life. They were blind, deaf, missing body parts, uh, they were, they had sexually transmitted diseases, they were gay, and they were uh, mental cases. And so that was the stew that he was put into. Along with that, uh, the prisoners were, were minimally fed. They would be given crusts of bread and a little soup, and many died simply of starvation. They died of fright. They died murdered in the middle of the night by a sadistic guard or strangled by a fellow prisoner. They died by being escorted to the quote showers, close quote, where they were gassed. They died by being brought out in front of a firing squad in the middle of uh, the, the, the um, square that was part of the, the barracks. And they also died because they were being worked in the quarries. And sometimes they were killed by felling rocks. So death was everywhere. And, and uh, along with not enough food and people stole his crusts of bread because they, he was blind. And so they could get away with it. And after five months in that hell realm, his body couldn't take it anymore and he became deathly ill. In fact, it was recognized that he was dying. There were three uh, doctors in the camp who were also prisoners 
and they diagnosed him with uh, several different conditions, all of them fatal. And so uh, a couple of other prisoners carried him off to what they euphemistically called the hospital, which was simply a piece of concrete out on the ground where at least they had a little space in which to die. They weren't in the midst of uh, the, the barracks that were so crowded that Jacques wrote that it was impossible to move in that space without bumping into another human being. And so what did he do? In a word, he did Zen practice, but it wasn't called that. He focused in on the experience of what was going on in his body. He was curious. And he felt every bit of energetic nuance that was going on there. His heart beating wildly out of sync. His kidneys shutting down. His intestinal tract writhing as if it were uh, a knife ridden snakes. His face swollen up with a condition called uh, syphilis, which was, uh, was also one that could have been fatal. And he tuned in so completely and let go of so 100% of his felt need to be safe, to be alive, to be healed, not to be frightened. He let go all of it. And the result is he survived. Not only did he survive, but it's very clear that he had a deep Kensho experience. He wrote that he found joy and that the joy never left him. Even though there were 11 more months before the camp was liberated by the allies, the joy never left him. And decades later, when he was uh, in the United States teaching at a college level, his students were so entranced by his, his uh, demeanor that they asked him about his history. And so he wrote, and that is how we know about that experience. It's a model for all of us, really. And thankfully, none of us will have to go through Buchenwald, I hope. The world is pretty crazy right now, so one never knows. And that is also very uh, uh, anxiety producing for many, many, many people. But then we also have our own um, growing up experiences and the ways we compensated for the pain that came forth from that. And the one way to work with it effectively is to walk right into the physical experience, the energetic experience in, in our body of what that anxiety, what that fear, what that anger, and it's going to be probably all of those, along with some grief. But as we explore it intimately, not from here, it won't do us any good to try to story it out, try to analyze it. It has to be felt in the body in order to become freed from, but it's powerful. I know this because I've, I've gone through this myself over many, many, many years, and it works. And I can guarantee that if you've got any kind of difficult history and you've come to Zen practice seeking for a way to become free of it, there is a way to become free of it, but it's only going to be by walking right into the pain. It is tremendously effective. And you can do it. Of course, it also can help to have a good therapist. 
particularly one who understands Zen practice. Uh, I, I've known some people that did therapy with people that didn't have a meditation practice of their own and, and it didn't work out well. Now, there are certain things that can come up for us in Zen practice that are not necessarily understood by people who haven't been there, done that themselves. So uh, don't be afraid to ask for help. It can make a huge difference in your Zen practice. And the thing is this, this wad, this walled off area that we have so necessarily walled off and kept um, under lock and key uh, since, since a long time, we've done because it's so painful. But now, in the interest of becoming free from it, because it'll drive us, regardless of whether we open that vault or not. Uh, and we will be so much freer when we do open it and work through it and allow ourselves to experience what we have barred ourselves against, locked inside of ourselves for so long. It even speaks to this in the Bible. What, uh, what you keep within you can cause you pain. What you open up to can free you. This is quite paraphrased here. Um, but all of us, all of us doing Zen practice are seeking liberation. And liberation doesn't mean some fancy thing up in the sky. Liberation means right here now, eating breakfast, um, going to the store, losing our job, uh, finding friends dying, um, enjoying a new baby, walking in the woods so that it can be fully and totally experienced in all its tremendous nuance, joy, pain, grief. When we feel 100%, it's not the problem we think it will be. But the reason I'm bringing this up on the first day of Sashin is because uh, it is something that if we are to truly deepen our Zen practice, it needs to be paid attention to, worked with, open to. And then, it's amazing, it, 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 we can clear the decks so that our practice can go much deeper, much faster, particularly if we are working with a therapist. So if there's any, any challenge in your life, open to it fully. Again, not the story of it, but how it feels in your body. And be curious, explore it. Who knows, it may trigger a Kensho experience. Beyond that, it's about focus. It's about that exploration, really, really deeply exploring, being really curious about things that we have never really been curious about. We've sort of overridden any, any interest or curiosity in them. Now is the time to really explore. I always hark back to Gordy Bruin, who, uh, appeared incredibly focused uh, in one Sashin in particular. Back then we were all in Sashin together many, many times during every year. And, and in that particular Sashin, he actually broke through, he had a Kensho. And afterwards he said, why didn't somebody tell me? It's about exploring your own mind. It's about exploring your own mind. <clears throat> so I leave you with that. 
And let's see what time it is. We still have about 15 minutes. So um, I think we'll continue sitting. And um, the period will end when the Jikijutsu ends the period at the appropriate time. So let me see if I can turn this off. Oops, no, I forgot one thing. We want first to recite the four vowels. Shujo mo hen se gando mo no mu jin se gandan. Omun Muryo Segangaku Butsu Do Mujo Seganjo Shujo Muhen Segando Mono Mujin Segandan O mun muryo se gan gaku butsu do mujo se gan do shu jo mu hen se gan do bo no mu jin se gan dan o mun Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to liberate them. Clinging is inexhaustible. I vow to put an end to it. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to master them. The way of liberation is unsurpassable. I vow to become it. <laughs> <laughs>